Cosmopolitan UK put this on the cover, and it stirred a lot of controversy. What do you imagine they're talking about here? Cosmopolitan UK put this on the cover, and it stirred a lot of controversy. And now that you've seen the video to that audio, thoughts? Referring to a person as a this, especially when you put that emphasis on it, is definitely stigmatizing. To be fair, the Cosmo cover also uses the objectifier this, but it's understood to mean this person doing this activity. Dr. Mike, however, seems to be using this to refer to the person's body shape. In a video where the doctor should first do no harm, he stigmatizes someone's weight, which, with evidence I'll show momentarily, results in poor health outcomes, both for those labeled normal and overweight. I'm not calling out Dr. Mike as a bad doctor or even one whose advice you should disregard. Instead, I'm pointing to a pattern of fat phobia within the medical community. Dr. Mike is certainly more knowledgeable medically than the average person, but that doesn't stop him from participating in what may be the more harmful act of unconscious weight bias. But let's go back to the Cosmo cover. Dr. Mike is correct in pointing out that the use of the wording, this is healthy, is meant to stir the pot, partly due to the ambiguity of the words health and healthy. Cosmo, as a magazine existing within a for-profit framework, must continue its existence by getting people to buy its content, which sometimes can mean using controversy-inspiring text and imagery within its media. Is Cosmo saying the pictured person is healthy in every respect, or are they saying the fact the person is partaking in this activity is healthy? It's important to recognize that, as with YouTube thumbnails, there is a degree of provocation within each magazine cover. To be clear, I think all the women in these Cosmo covers look great. It's just a little uneasy sometimes seeing magazines utilize social justice to sell their product. But hey, that's capitalism. Now, before we continue, I do want to point out that this is no small feat this person is accomplishing here. I mean, look at the 90 degree angle between their legs, as well as the balance on just one leg. This is certainly someone who has above average flexibility. The World Health Organization provided this definition of health in 1984. The extent to which an individual or group is able to realize aspirations and satisfy needs and to change or cope with the environment. Health is a resource for everyday life, not the objective of living. It is a positive concept, emphasizing social and personal resources, as well as physical capacities. From this, we can gather that health is more a continuum than a switch, a matter of degrees rather than something you have or don't have. Health in this context is reflected in the individual aspirations of all persons. As a resource, health can be used to improve one's satisfaction with life, and thus expands beyond a more limited view of health as fitting into the ideal man. Fat phobia is going to the doctor's office and all of the chairs having arms on them, or, you know, having to ask for a seatbelt extender on the airplane. Those are things that are reflective of a fat phobic society. Fat phobia is more so of a systemic issue than it is like an, on an individual basis. And so this is very prevalent in the medical system and the medical model. So it's important for us to differentiate fat phobia and fat shaming because they're not the same. Again, it's very much possible for a person to be fat phobic without necessarily using fat shaming language or um, participating in fat shaming. Going back to the switch analogy, the discrete BMI ranges of normal, overweight, and obese may cloud medical practitioners' view of patients, automatically associating patients with a BMI over or even perceived as being over 25 with certain moral characteristics something which I discussed in the last video. It does bring up the question though, are there hard medical outcomes associated with overweight BMIs? And again, to be clear here, the medical classification of overweight is anyone with a BMI of 25 or greater. The health at every size framework is an approach to living that focuses more on the functional and sometimes social health outcomes rather than weight and other medical measurements. According to a 2015 article in the American Journal of Public Health, health at every step challenges some of the key assumptions to the approach of weight management, including higher percent body fat poses significant morbidity mortality risk. Weight loss will prolong life. 
Anyone who is determined can lose weight and keep it off through diet and exercise. The only way for people with obesity to improve their health is to lose weight. And obesity-related costs place a large burden on the economic and health system that can be corrected by focusing on obesity treatment and prevention. Proponents of health at every size are generally skeptical of the existence of an obesity epidemic. They perceive alarmists promoting this as wanting to manage weight. Health at every size encourages a fulfilling and meaningful lifestyle through intuitive eating, body acceptance, and physical activity for movement and health rather than for shape. While there is evidence the health at every size approach improves quality of life, eating habits, and can even lead to a reduction in weight, the current literature is lacking in key areas considering its recent development. Specifically with regard to small sample sizes, limited evaluation of physiological measures such as blood pressure and cholesterol, and a study population consisting of mostly white Western women with eating disorders and a BMI range of 25 to 35. Additionally, guidelines for the medical management of obesity compile evidence showing the health benefits of weight reduction for people deemed as medically overweight. Losing two and a half to five and a half kilograms is supported by strong evidence of a 30 to 60% reduction of risk for type two diabetes. In individuals with a BMI greater than 25 with concurrent type two diabetes, a five to 10% reduction of body weight is associated with a lowering of HbA1c by 0.6 to 1%. The strength of the evidence is more moderate, for the association between BMI and stroke, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. Interestingly, the association between BMI and all-cause mortality is J-shaped, with mortality reaching its lowest point at a BMI between 22.5 and 24.9 and increasing with both higher and lower BMIs. However, only a BMI greater than 30 shows a statistically significant difference in mortality compared to a BMI of 18.5 to 24.9. It's important to note that these data reflect associations and not necessarily causations. This means the underlying causal factor for these relationships could be due to something like weight stigmatization rather than a disease of fatness. There is evidence for increased food consumption and higher cortisol levels associated with weight stigmatization among people who are or even consider themselves overweight. Longitudinal studies have shown that weight stigmatization leads to a greater risk for obesity regardless of baseline BMI. The perception of oneself as overweight, even for those below a BMI of 25, is prospectively associated with high blood pressure, high triglycerides, and high blood sugar. This is thought to be caused by the chronic stress of weight stigmatization and the subsequent release of cortisol leading to inflammation. And so there are more and more studies showing these associations between BMI and negative health outcomes aren't explained solely by higher weight people having poorer health and may in fact be considerably affected by the societal ostracization of people with larger bodies. Just as Simone de Beauvoir noted in The Second Sex regarding the societal stigmatization of women, the stigmatization of people with larger bodies may be the primary cause of their higher negative health outcomes. The importance of health at every size is not only the recognition of this stigmatization, but also the treatment modalities that contribute to this pathological stress namely restrictive and often cyclic dietary patterns. Weight fluctuations associated with dieting themselves have been shown to cause high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and insulin resistance. Nevertheless, it's important to recognize, as one article puts it, there is a size threshold, albeit non-discreet, over which a person crosses over into a state of increased risk of or overt illness. This includes accompanying conditions such as asthma, arthritis, sleep apnea, and physical disability. In that regard, it's not possible to attain full health at the extremes of BMI, something the health at every size framework may not readily recognize. There is a need for increased health literacy, but as with Dr. Mike, these attempts at imparting knowledge should be made while respecting the lived experience of people with larger I bodies. I think there's a balance there. I, I think that we can have the covers like the Cosmo ones and say, look, 
people who are a bigger size can still be active and aspire to to a health, having a healthy body versus saying, this is how we all are and we should just live with it. So far in comparing the traditional medical approach to obesity with the health at every size framework, we've failed to look beyond the individual. Both the biomedical model of health that we've discussed in looking at excessive body fat as an illness, as well as the health at every size framework, which would fit into a more functional medicine model of health, don't address larger societal structures. While the exact definition of obesity may be up for some debate, that is at what BMI we would consider someone obese as well as considering more accurate measures such as waist circumference, it's clear we live in an area where access to higher calorie food is more widespread than ever, which does have the benefit of staving off the negative health outcomes of starvation. However, what has been called our current obesogenic environment does increase the number of people who suffer from the higher extremes of weight gain. To focus on individual lifestyles while ignoring the discrepancy between overabundant, high calorie, low nutrient, low cost, and larger portion sized food compared to the inadequacy of healthier food options means that policies aiming to reduce the negative health outcomes of the upper extremes of BMI continue to treat the downstream effect of this built environment on the people living in it, rather than focusing on changing the environment itself. What we need is a more balanced consideration of all three of these health models, the biomedical, the functional, and the social. They're not gonna talk to you about it. They'll never show up at your office ever again. And you're losing the opportunity to create a positive change, what you perceive to be a positive change in that person's life because you're not willing to like, nip, zip the lips for like five minutes. As a medical health professional, it may be easy to say, especially when supported by confirmation bias, if they just lost some weight, they would make their life so much better. And it's that thinking that lies at the heart of the fat phobic nature of modern medicine. Fat phobia doesn't mean that intentions are insincere. It means that as medical professionals, we've fit the person in front of us into a box and thus our patients become less a person and more a project. We shouldn't go into health to fix people. It's not hierarchical like that. Our role as health practitioners is to be a resource of knowledge and skills alongside people trying to realize their aspirations for life. It's important then that we check our biases and begin to recognize the diverse nature of health. So we're really just starting to scratch the surface here on the topic of health and size, and there's a lot more I have to cover with this. In fact, the video that I had originally planned at the beginning of the year is probably not gonna come out for another couple months. Last time I told you that we would talk about body positivity and health outcomes, but once I started looking into the health at every size framework, I realized that we would really need to cover that and more of just the general health outcomes with obesity in order to look at body positivity as a movement and also the medical expenses of health outcomes from obesity. That being said, if you haven't seen my last video on the moralization of weight, that is a great place to start. I should have the next video out within the next two to three weeks, so stay on the lookout for that. And as with last time, I would love to know your thoughts on the topic here today. And I've even thought about doing a live stream-esque discussion style thing where we could all chime in on the evidence and share our opinions. If that's something that interests you, then please let me know some way. And I also appreciate everyone who commented last time on the video and shared what they had to offer. Look out for some kicking of plastic next week and until next time.